So it's my great pleasure to introduce our speaker tonight. Our lecture is entitled um, Growing Healthy Babies, Nutrition Tips for Pregnancy, Preconception, Pregnancy, and Postpartum. Susan Carter received her master's degree in nutrition from Oregon State University. She went on to complete a dietetic internship at the UCSF Medical Center, where she then continued to work as a clinical dietitian and diabetes educator, specializing in pregnancy and diabetes. She transferred to Stanford Hospital in 2000 as a research dietitian. She currently is a diabetes educator and dietitian for the OB clinic and for the Sweet Success Diabetes and Pregnancy Program at Lucille Packard Children's Hospital. So please join me in welcoming her. So what a great place to work when uh, the final product of uh, your end of, end of the day is beautiful babies. So uh, it, welcome to all of you. It's a pleasure to be here. I recognize some of my patients in the audience. So hopefully this will be informative and not stressful to anybody to hear about good nutrition. And just keep in mind that nutrition, like most areas of science, is sort of fluid. Guidelines are changing constantly. Felice and I were talking when I came in. If I'd given this talk when I was pregnant uh, 24 years ago, I would have said something completely different. So now I look back and think, oh my gosh, my diet wasn't anywhere where it should have been uh, compared to uh, what we know now. So don't stress too much. Most women have healthy babies, and I want you to keep that in mind. So generally, what are our basic goals for all pregnant women, and really for all of us? Um, we want to optimize maternal and fetal health by providing optimal nutrition at key times. Uh, the reason this talk starts with preconception are there's, there are some nutrients in our diet that are vitally important even coming into pregnancy. We'll talk a little bit later about folic acid, and the recommendation is to have adequate folic acid in the diet um, coming into pregnancy to reduce the risk of certain birth defects. Uh, we want to avoid consuming any substance that could be harmful to maternal health or to fetal well-being. And we also want to start establishing healthy habits that are going to model a healthy lifestyle and diet for our children. You're going to find that um, children are very good scrutinizers of um, any uh, fallacies they see if you are not doing what you tell them to do. So I often will tell parents, you can't oh, crack open a Coca-Cola and a bag of potato chips and then tell your kids to eat their broccoli. You really have to model what you want your kids to do. So what does a healthy eating style look like? And I apologize for this really busy slide, but that's why I made a copy for you as well. And um, originally I had on the top of this slide my healthy pregnancy plate. And I took that off because all of us could learn from this. And I, I borrowed heavily from Walter Willett, who is, Walter Willett is the um, head of Harvard School of Public Health. But you can see this modeled in a lot of areas, sort of the plate method. And one thing you don't notice on this plate at all is any processed foods. And more and more um, healthcare professionals, scientists, nutritional researchers are finding we really need to go back to a more whole food diet, more plant-based foods, and get rid of some of the processed foods in the diet. Um, I just read a big headline coming out of research from the UK that's saying junk food is not good for a uh, preconception period. Well, yeah. Junk food's not good any of the rest of the time either. But we want to emphasize, again, most of the time your food choices should be healthy, sort of the 80% rule. But we want to have mostly filling up our plate with about half fruits and vegetables. Some people may say, why am I picking uh, more vegetables on that plate than fruit? I often will tell patients, well, think of fruits as vegetables with added sugar. You get all the vitamins, all the minerals, all the fibers. Uh, that you need, would get in fruits in vegetables without the added sugar. And uh, Robert Lustig is a very interesting researcher at UCSF. If you've read his articles in Nature Magazine and some of his research on sugar in the diet, he says, historically, uh, our time on the planet, most of our diet didn't include any sugar except for that brief period of time once a year when fruit came in season. Um, protein food is very essential, but you'll notice we want to emphasize more chicken, more poultry, more, um, more vegetable sources of protein like beans and lentils, almonds. Um, eggs have been redeemed. You might have noticed if you've looked at the 2015 USDA dietary guidelines, we can now have an egg a day again. For years, we were very worried about the cholesterol in eggs. Eggs are a very important source of protein and choline, an important nutrient for um, fetal brain development. So go ahead and have your eggs during pregnancy if you like eggs. And replace the starchy uh, white bread and the starchy white potatoes, white rice with more whole greens, beans, and lentils. Um, those are a really important part of our diets as well. This part of the slide I'm not going to go into a lot. I just put it there to um, talk about some of the topics I'm going to be covering tonight. 
Um, I'm going to talk about calorie intake. You're not eating for two. Um, healthy diets, grow healthy babies, staying active. I asked a couple of our doctors um, that work in OB clinic, what would they recommend that I say to you tonight as you are getting ready to conceive, as you're in your pregnancies? And most of them, there was a common theme. The one thing they wanted me to tell you was to be active during your pregnancy. One of our doctors said when she was seeing one of our other doctors, the infamous Kay Daniels, if any of you know her, most of our patients just love her. Uh, she had gone to her first OB visit with Dr. Daniels, and the first thing Dr. Daniels said to her is, what's your plan for being active during your pregnancy? And she was really surprised that that was the first thing she mentioned. So being physically active. Um, this is near and dear to my heart because I was put on complete bed rest from 22 weeks on with my pregnancy, and shortly after my pregnancy, my, my doctor told me, you know, we've learned that giving you all that bed rest just tortured you unnecessarily for three months. It makes no difference in preventing preterm deliveries. So um, a lot of you are saved from the fun I had of spending three months with complete bed rest. So preconception, let's start out with preconception and then we'll move on to talking about pregnancy and a little bit about the postpartum period. So why is preconception so important? Well, most of us get pregnant without really planning on it. I'm sure you guys are all very good planners and uh, no unplanned pregnancies, but 50% of the pregnancies in this country are unplanned. By eight weeks gestational age, your baby already has a complete nervous system and a beating heart. So if you wait to improve your diet till you know you're pregnant, for a lot of women, it's too late to prevent birth defects. And we know that a good diet can reduce the risk of having a baby with a congenital anomaly. So we're going to talk about body mass index or your weight starting pregnancy, nutrients and lifestyle that might impact your baby's health right from the beginning, and maybe some screenings to check in with your doctor before um, you decide to become pregnant. Um, I'm not going to talk uh, too much about body mass index, but it will be a theme that we're going to talk about during pregnancy. Um, obesity prevalence in women of childbearing ages has gone, has increased 64% between when they measured it in 1988 to 1994, and most recently the statistics we have are from 2007 to 2008. So in 2010, about 32% of U.S. women aged 20 to 39 met the definition for um, obesity. So the population has really changed um, a lot. Uh, so um, what does that look like if you want to, most of us don't think about body mass index. Um, a normal BMI for a woman who's five foot four would be 108 to 144 pounds. But most of the women uh, five foot four tall um, nowadays weigh about 168, 170 pounds. And there are some risk factors regarding your pregnancy if you do start pregnancy with a little bit of extra weight. Um, it can cause some infertility issues, increased risk of hypertensive disorders, increased risk of gestational diabetes, hypertension, preeclampsia, and more likely that you need a C-section delivery. But there's some ways you can mitigate this risk. So um, uh, if you look at all the health organizations, they say, oh, well, just achieve a normal body weight before you become pregnant. Well, I once had a patient in the research unit who said he hadn't gone to the doctor for 10 years because he'd gone to the doctor who told him, you need to lose 100 pounds. And he found that information so devastating that he didn't do anything for 10 years. So I think that we're doing our uh, women that want to plan a pregnancy a disservice if we tell them you'll have to lose 100 pounds before you become pregnant. Start walking, improve your diet, and then um, that might be enough to mitigate the risk. For moms, uh, maternal obesity and what are the risks to the baby? Um, babies can be too big, and that can increase the risk of being overweight later in life. Increased NICU admission. Um, babies can have higher risk of low blood sugar if they're born too big. And if mom's heavier at the beginning of pregnancy, it may increase risk of certain birth defects. Um, interesting, we're going to talk about folic acid and its role in reducing the risk of neural tube defects. Um, uh, obese women, if you look statistically, are less likely to be taking enough folic acid at the uh, time of pregnancy onset. So a real important um, nutrition tidbit for women to make sure they're getting enough folic acid. So preconception action plan for a woman who is overweight. Um, if if you just have a few pounds to lose, that's great. Um, but if you are in an obese BMI category, you might be able to reduce your risk significantly by losing a little bit of weight before pregnancy starts or improving your diet and at least getting started on a healthy lifestyle. I know from my years in a research unit, we did a lot of study looking at insulin resistance. And we talked a lot about what about the heavy patient who's most at risk, and they tended to be more sedentary and have more inflammation and chronic risk factors. You can be fit at a heavier weight, and that also might mitigate risk of pregnancy. 
Um, so a sample weight loss plan for a woman who's in an obese body range, if she was 190 pounds, losing just 14 pounds might be enough to reduce her risk. This is data from the Diabetes Prevention Program that found that just 7% body weight um, could reduce the risk of developing diabetes for patients that have prediabetes by almost 60% um, over the period that they followed them. So let's move on to preconception nutrition. What should your diet look like if you're planning for pregnancy? Obviously, you want to avoid toxins. Um, minimize alcohol consumption. Some studies show you should start avoiding alcohol even when you start thinking about becoming pregnant. And you want to make sure you're consuming adequate uh, folic acid and vitamin B12. So the U United States actually recommends for all women of childbearing age that you should be consuming a, a multivitamin that has enough folic acid for um, uh, so in case you accidentally became pregnant, your baby would not be at risk for a higher risk for a neural tube defect. So what about preconception lifestyle goals? Um, how many of you are already doing some physical activity on a regular basis? Okay, great. Looks like the majority of people in here. These are recommendations, again, for everybody. Um, sometimes I'd like to emphasize that because I see a lot of expectant dads in the room in addition to potential moms, too. And um, I just want to tell you dads out there that you're not the diet police. You're co-partners in this game. And we should, um, I think, some, occasionally I've been an arbitrator of marital disputes in my office where dad says she's supposed to be exercising, and, and that's generally not helpful. So these are all guidelines that all of us could benefit from. Minimally, uh, 20 minutes exercise a day, and keep that up. Start it before you become pregnant, and keep it up um, during your pregnancy. Obviously, we don't want to smoke, use medications, or substances that could impact fetal development as well. So if you're planning pregnancy, it might be time to go visit your doctor, particularly if you have some underlying medical conditions, or maybe even just a family history of certain medical conditions. Um, consider get screening for diabetes if diabetes runs in your family, especially if you have a parent or a sibling with diabetes. There's a quick test called glycosylated hemoglobin or hemoglobin A1C that can measure how sugar-coated your red blood cells are and tell if you have a higher risk for diabetes. We do this test on all our pregnant women here at Stanford, and we do pick up on a fair number of women that didn't know they had either prediabetes or diabetes, and then they come to my office for some counseling. I just got back from a diabetes conference, and the current statistics, according to the CDC, are that about one of every 11 adults in this country has diabetes, and one of every three adults has prediabetes, and about a quarter of those people are unaware that they even have this condition. So you've gone through great pre-pregnancy planning, you started exercising, and congratulations, I see at least three women, I think, out there that are uh, pregnant right now. So congratulations on becoming pregnant. What are your goals now? Well, we're going to talk about weight all the way through because weight's a factor coming into pregnancy, during pregnancy, and afterwards. We want to have appropriate weight gain during pregnancy. We want to have a good lifestyle. Food safety is extra important for pregnant women. You're a little more vulnerable to foodborne illness. And there are po populations that have special nutritional needs during pregnancy. And I want to talk a little bit about how uncomfortable it can be to be uh, three months into your pregnancy or six months into your pregnancy and be constipated and have heartburn and uh, just be generally miserable. Maybe explain a little bit about why that happens and give you some remedies for it. So these are the Institute of Medicine weight gain recommendations um, that all of you have probably seen. I highlighted in green the lower end of the range because there were some big studies done recently, um, including up at UCSF, Naomi Stotland looked at about 20,000 pregnancies. And what she found is most women gain more than is what, is what is recommended. And there were more problems both with babies and moms if you gain at the upper end versus the lower end. So historically, these recommendations were all geared towards preventing low birth weight babies. And I even had a discussion with one of my patients from China recently. Why are you worried about my baby being too big with diabetes? Um, big babies are healthy babies. We think of that as a strong, good characteristic in China. And I said, well, we know a little bit more that big babies aren't necessarily a, a, a healthy baby. And you don't want your wife to have to push out a 10-pound baby if we can prevent that. So that might not be the most fun. So um, there, there's a lot of data coming out that maybe we should revise these guidelines, especially at the upper end. Um, I think there's pretty good evidence if you gain at the low end of the Institute of Medicine um, guidelines. If you start out your pregnancy at a normal BMI, that's great. But once you um, have reached an obese BMI category above 30, is it really good to recommend um, a 20-pound weight gain, especially um, if you have a woman who might be coming into pregnancy with 100 pounds extra weight on her body? She might not need that weight gain. 
So these are some of the studies. 43% of the women in the Naomi Stotland study gained more weight than was recommended. And when, again, we're already thinking that weight gain may be a little bit um, on the high side. Excess weight gain is associated with more problems than low gain. And excess weight gain can increase risk of heavier babies, NICU admission, and uh, overweight status later in life. Um, limited or no weight gain in obese pregnant women has been ha found to have favorable outcomes. And again, we have to be cautious here because I know a lot of you are overachievers. I don't want you to start restricting your food intake. And remember, when we talk about limited or no weight gain, this is in obese women. If you started your pregnancy to healthy weight, you do need to gain enough weight. So don't starve yourself. I, I see women that take this to heart and they're so afraid of gaining too much weight that they aren't gaining enough weight. Um, there was a real interesting study, the 2013 uh, study there, I, I cited American Journal of Obstetrics and Gynecology. They looked at just at obese women, and they actually found the most favorable outcomes were in women that had a little bit of weight loss during their pregnancy. And they found with a little bit of weight loss in obese women, about 70% fewer C-section deliveries and about 50% reduction in large for gestational age babies. But again, the flip side of this, starvation isn't good for babies either. During the Nazi occupation in Holland, um, there were pregnant women that were uh, only getting about 600 calories per day. And uh, a few years later, when those uh, boys from those pregnancies entered the Dutch army, they found that the recruits that had been exposed to famine during the first half of pregnancy were more likely to be obese later in life. So extremes of the caloric supply in utero can actually change physiologically how your baby's metabolism develops. So these babies probably developed very thrifty mechanisms at storing fat so to protect them from um, the next famine. So the pattern of weight gain appears to be very important as well. Um, the first trimester, I, I put down at the bottom there the size of your baby at the end of the first 12 weeks. People have been very concerned. I didn't gain any weight the first trimester because I was so nauseated. I was vomiting a lot. And I said, well, you know, at 12 weeks, your baby weighs about half an ounce and, and is two inches long. So if you gained a lot of weight in that period, it probably wasn't going to baby. So uh, a lot of studies are now showing we don't need to eat anymore during the first trimester. Um, now, sometimes it may help nausea and vomiting to eat a little more frequently, but you don't have a big caloric increase. And the new guidelines are that you don't need to increase your calories at all in the first uh, 13 weeks, roughly, of pregnancy. So the normal weight person, uh, you might have a little increase in your weight there, and that's usually expanding blood volume. And you women out there, if you've been pregnant or are pregnant now, you notice how exhausted you are in that first part of pregnancy. Your blood volume is expanding. That's one reason you're having to urinate all the time, and it's also why you're tired. Your cardiovascular system is getting used to that um, increased blood volume. Second trimester weight gain um, is when baby starts really starting to put on the pounds. Um, at 23 weeks, your baby weighs uh, a little over a pound. It's about 11 inches long. And then by uh, 37 weeks, uh, baby can be 6.3 to 7 pounds and be about 19 inches long. So second and third trimester weight gain seems to be important, especially in multiple gestation pregnancies. Anybody out here expecting twins that they know? OK. So we know that, um, and uh, some studies have indicated getting um, extra weight gain in the first trimester is important if you're expect, expecting multiples. So that no weight gain in the first trimester probably does not apply if you're expecting twins. If you're expecting twins and more, you probably do need to um, gain more weight. There's a little controversy about how much weight that needs to be. Um, one study showed 24 pounds by 24 weeks was important. So um, we'll talk a little bit more when I go into the twin section there. But back to the excess weight gain, gaining too much weight uh, in the first half of pregnancy does seem to be more strongly associated with overweight in babies later in pregnancy. So where does the weight go? And again, this is just rough numbers here. Things can vary. Um, after I delivered, I can remember uh, the doctor standing in the back of the room saying, look at the size of that placenta. So I had two placentas that had merged. So it was a huge placenta, I remember. But the placenta average weight is one to two pounds. Amniotic fluid volume can be two to three pounds. Some women have more, some women have less. Your uterus gains a little bit of weight. Uh, extra blood volume. Average baby weight's about seven and a half pounds. And the maternal stores can vary hugely. Um, you've all had friends or heard stories about people gaining 100 pounds in pregnancy. So um, if you're gaining a lot of extra weight, um, it may not uh, be going to baby. A lot of women will ask me, they're very concerned. They might come into pregnancy with a body mass index of 35 or 40, but they're still worried if they're not gaining weight. How can my baby gain weight if I don't? Well, baby is pulling nutrients from your bloodstream 24 hours a day. 
the pattern of the, your caloric and your nutrient intake may be import, more important than your weight gain. So you want to be eating small, frequent meals, steady supply of nutrients. Your, your bloodstream provides amino acids, uh, fatty acids, calories consistently to baby. So um, your baby can gain weight um, even if you don't gain weight. So, um, so don't worry. A lot of studies have definitely shown that. And again, I want to caution you. I see a lot of women healthy weight out there. Do not restrict your weight gain uh, too s severely if you are uh, starting out pregnancy to healthy weight or underweight. Underweight women need to gain more. Women with multiple pregnancy need to gain more. And uh, we want to find just the right balance. I sometimes feel like this is a fairy tale. We don't want to have not too much, not too little, just the right amount. So maternal diet and pregnancy, let's start by looking at macronutrients, calories, protein, carbohydrate, and fat. Um, I just put a little slide in here cautioning about, I, I try to bring in some environmental concerns occasionally. Water bottles um, um, may be a source of um, contaminants. We've all heard about BPA in water bottles. Um, there's a lot of toxins in plastic that can leach into that water, especially if you like leave your water bottle in a hot car. The, the heating of it tends to allow more of the of the chemicals to leach into the water. So I recommend get a nice good stainless steel water bottle and you can fill that up from the tap and um, tap water is probably a little bit better regulated than um, uh, bottled water anyway. Uh, water is really important during pregnancy. So I mentioned I was put on bed rest for preterm labor. My doctor told she was part of a research study that found one of the few things you can do to reduce the risk of a preterm delivery is staying well hydrated. When your body becomes dehydrated, that same bloodstream that's carrying nutrients uh, to the, the uterus uh, can cause the uterus to have a diminished blood supply and you can start contracting. So it's really important to drink plenty of water. Your body needs about three liters of water a day during pregnancy, more during lactation. That does include the water that you get from foods. You know, Watermelon really does have a high water content. A lot of fruits and vegetables have a high water content, and that does count as well. So don't be overwhelmed by that three liters a day. A lot of people say, well, how, much, how do I know I'm drinking enough water? Well, you should be peeing a lot, and most of you are peeing all the time. If you're pregnant, that's really common. But you should be urinating regularly. Your urine shouldn't be very concentrated or dark in color. It will get a nice bright yellow color urine right after you take your prenatal vitamin, and that's when you're peeing out all your extra B vitamins. But the rest of the time, if you're not urinating frequently or your urine's very dark in color, up your water and take a little bit. And you know, some people sweat more than others. If you're really physically active on hot weather, you, you need more water. Water. Calorie intake in pregnancy can vary hugely. And again, I say, um, look at measures how your baby's growing. Are you showing a steady weight gain? We're kind of obsessed with your urine during pregnancy. You notice we dip it every visit when you come in and we check your urine to see if it's super concentrated. And we also check to see if you're spilling something called ketones in your urine. If you're not eating enough calories during the day, your body starts burning its own fat too rapidly and that can produce ketones, which we don't think are as good for baby. But uh, for a slim woman, I had a woman in my office yesterday who is, uh, weighs 90 pounds and she's four foot 11. She probably can get by in about 1,800 calories to 2,000 calories a day in pregnancy. Whereas a five foot 10 woman expecting twins or triplets might need more than 3,500 calories per day. So, um, you know, don't force yourself to eat beyond hunger, but you should be eating regularly. And I gave you some general numbers there. Usually you need about 35 to 40 calories per kilogram per day for pregnancy with a normal BMI for a singleton pregnancy. And again, no extra calories in the first trimester, but second and third trimester, maybe 350 to 450 extra calories per day. The pattern of caloric intake seems to be really important. Uh, one study, the first one I cited below there, showed that if you eat less than three meals and two snacks per day, increased risk of preterm delivery. Um, and there's all been a lot of studies by a researcher named Barbara Luke who's looked at um, optimizing um, good outcomes in triplet and, and twin pregnancies. And what she found is interesting. The pattern of eating was really important. You need to eat every two to three hours. So her eating regimen to grow these healthier multiple gestational pregnancies was um, eating uh, three meals and three snacks a day. And think about combining with those meals. You want to provide not just a, a bunch of glucose for your babies, not just carbohydrate, but some protein and some fat with that as well. So avoid long periods without eating. Um, that can actually increase levels of metabolites, like we talked about ketones, which can, again, cause some contractions to happen. So I usually tell pregnant women, um, you're, you've got an accelerated starvation going on. While you're sleeping at night, baby's pulling nutrients from your bloodstream. So eat when you first wake up in the morning, and then have snacks throughout the day. And probably most of you, if you're pregnant, know how, how hungry you can get. 
but you're not really eating for two. Again, historically, these weight gain guidelines were based on preventing low birth weight babies. Um, you don't want to overdo the calories as well, especially during the first half of pregnancy. So where do women get the extra calories? Um, I always talk about fluid intake. That first slide I showed you about what a healthy diet looks like, you notice I emphasize drinking enough water. I never said increase fluids. Um, a lot of time when I used to get patients referred to me for excess weight gain, I would say, well, what are you drinking? Oh, well, since pregnancy, I'm drinking a, a liter of orange juice a day. I'm drinking lots and lots of juice, lots of, uh, the doctor says I have to get a lot of liquids in. So we need to change our terminology and encourage you to drink more water because you don't really want to get all the extra calories in from the fruit juices. And again, look at a lot of the research that's coming out now. It's much better for us to eat a whole piece of fruit than to drink in all that liquid sugar. And a lot of people say, well, it's fresh squeezed juice. Well, if you look down at the bottom of that slide, even fresh squeezed orange juice, um, 16 ounces of it, it contains the equivalent of about 10 teaspoons of sugar. And in our bodies, there's not really a lot of difference. It all ends up as turning into glucose, sugar from Coca-Cola or sugar from orange juice. Um, so pregnancy protein needs are also very important. Um, protein provides amino acids for your baby's muscle development, to, for your baby to make enzymes, antibodies, collagen. Pregnant women need more protein, um, about 1 to 1.5 grams per kilogram per day. Most of us in the United States get enough protein. Um, this would be about 70 to 100 grams a day for most people. Um, women expecting multiple pregnancy, uh, twins or more, do need to get more protein, maybe 140 to 200 grams per day. Um, if you're a vegetarian uh, or follow a restricted diet of any kind, you might not get enough protein in your diet. This slide I just put in here to give you some ideas of the various places you can get protein. Again, I like uh, for pregnant women, it's a good idea when you're planning a snack, uh, have a piece of fruit, but add, add a handful of almonds with that. If you look there, an ounce of almonds can give you as much protein as you get from an ounce of meat. Eggs, I'm glad that the restriction on eggs has sort of been lifted by USDA dietary advice. Uh, go ahead and have an egg a day if you feel like it. They're great sources of protein and a lot of other um, nutrients, including choline. Um, if you eat yogurt, Greek yogurt's a great source. Um, I'm a big believer in getting some more plant-based protein in your diet. Beans and lentils can be great because they not only are a good source of protein, but if you're having any constipation with pregnancy, great sources of fiber and minerals such as magnesium as well. Um, a lot of new studies are coming out showing that all of us, whether we're pregnant or not, should limit our intake of red meat. As a diabetes educator, I'm always looking at what are the things that cause gestational diabetes. And one of the things that's been implicated in causing diabetes both during the pregnancy and outside pregnancy is increased red meat consumption. So a lot of studies, uh, there was a big study that just came out in Europe recently looking at the impact of red meat have linked uh, red meat intake with increased risk of diabetes, gestational diabetes, and just general causes of uh, illness that can decrease lifespan. Um, they say it's an even higher risk if you're doing a lot of the processed red meat, sausages, bacon, things like that. So um, replace a little bit of your red meat intake with more plant proteins, and that's a healthful change. Um, I came back from the generation of fat was all bad. We now know that all fat is not equal, and fat is essential for our babies. Um, fat can be very satisfying during pregnancy, and there are essential fatty acids that are necessary for baby's fetal brain development, eye tissue. There are two fatty acids we must get from the diet that we're not able to synthesize independently, and that's linoleic acid that we tend to get plenty of from vegetable oils, and then alpha-linolenic acid or omega-3 fatty acids, which you've probably all heard of. They've gotten a, a lot of um, press recently. Trans fatty acids are being mostly removed from the food market. Um, back in the 50s, Crisco and, um, and, uh, and margarines came on the market, where, and it was a process where they hydrogenated liquid oils to give them uh, greater shelf stability and better baking properties. We now know these trans fatty acids that are mostly found now in processed foods and uh, margarine and hydro partially hydrogenated oils. Um, are, are harmful. They do cross the placenta and can have adverse effects on babies and their cell membrane development. So you want to avoid trans fatty acids and choose moderate amounts. Again, the plant oils tend to be a little more healthful than the animal oils. So canola oil, vegetable oil, avocado, and nuts and seeds. 
Um, some women um, take a prenatal vitamin that already has a good source of the docohexanoic acid or the eicosapentaenoic acid, which are a couple of the omega-3 fatty acids that we think have some great uh, anti-inflammatory properties. Some studies have shown um, that having enough of these uh, omega-3 fatty acids may improve neural development in our babies and actually reduce risk of preterm labor. Other studies haven't shown that, but uh, generally it's recommended to consume about 200 milligrams per day of these fatty acids. You can get them from walnuts, uh, but you get uh, the precursor, you get the ALA, the alpha linolenic acid from walnuts. Uh, usually you only get the other, uh, the EPA and the DHA from fish. Um, sardines, I put a picture there, are a good source because they're small fish, not a lot of mercury. But you can also get them from marine algae as well. Um, Expectolipil is just one brand that's on the market. It's a, it's a a uh, supplement for exclusively for pregnant women, and it gets the DHA from um, marine algae. Um, I think nuts are a great source for healthy fats, and um, I'm sure probably a lot of you have heard about some of the recent studies vindicating nuts. Um, again, back when I was pregnant, there was some concern about if we eat too many nuts, is that going to increase the risk of peanut allergy? Now we can actually find the opposite is true. This was a recent study that was just published last year, and they looked at 8,200 um, mothers and, who were not themselves allergic to nuts. If you are allergic to nuts, you should avoid them during pregnancy because you don't want your body to have these inflammatory antibodies that may increase baby's risk. But they found the women consuming at least five servings uh, a week of nuts had 70% less likely to have a child with a nut allergy. Uh, there was another study that's also getting some play recently called the LEAP study, learning early about peanut allergy, again finding there might be an optimal time to introduce peanuts uh, in child's uh, diet. And this was fascinating. They actually looked at ethnically similar groups. They looked at Jewish children in Israel who I guess there's some peanutty snack there. It's not real peanuts, but this puffed peanut snack that is introduced in babies' diets starting at about six months of age, compared to do Jewish kids raised in the UK. And they found strikingly higher incidence of peanut allergy in the UK where peanuts weren't in introduced until later in life. So this LEAP study, again, is showing that maybe there may be key time opportunities that we should introduce a good variety of foods, both into maternal diet and into, and into our children's diet. I apologize in advance. Um, my specialty is diabetes, so I'm going to talk about carbohydrate more than any of the other macronutrients. So we do need carbohydrate in pregnancy. Again, the first thing when I get um, somebody in my office who wants to be very compliant and I tell them they have gestational diabetes, they want to cut the carbs out of the diet. And I say, whoa, gestational diabetes occurs because your baby requires glucose for its developing brain and nervous system. The recommended uh, daily allowance for carbohydrate in pregnancy is 175 grams a day more if you're expecting twins. Most, most of the American diet does get enough carbohydrate in their diet. Um, and again, the pattern of carbohydrate intake is better. You don't want to flood baby with a big glut of um, you know, six cups of pasta with your dinner with, with garlic bread and then starve for the next 24 hours. It requires oxygen to process that carbohydrate. So give your baby little bits of glucose throughout the day. That's, they can utilize it more. It doesn't stress them. But you do need carbohydrate. This is just one way women can, uh, all of us can overdo the carbohydrate. This looks like a breakfast I would have eaten when I was pregnant because back then we thought carbs were all great and fat was all bad. Now we know a little bit differently. But just a cup of raisin bran, half a banana, milk, and orange juice, that's equivalent to about 25 teaspoons of sugar. And there's not a lot of protein in that breakfast. So again, when I talk about more balanced, maybe like a yogurt parfait with some nuts and uh, fruit with it, whole grain cereal with some nuts on it, uh, have an egg scramble with some veggies in the morning, or make a, a breakfast burrito, something like that. And these are good ideas for snacks, too. So small, frequent boluses of mixed meals may be the best way to eat during pregnancy. A lot of people get hung up on looking at sugar on food labels. And this is just a caution here to not look just for sugar. It doesn't tell the whole story. Any of you that have studied chemistry know that starch breaks down into sugar very rapidly in our body, bodies. And a bagel is probably equivalent to eating about 12 teaspoons of sugar, which is um, more than twice what you'd get in a, an average uh, a chocolate bar. I happen to love chocolate, too, so I put that slide in there. Um, Sugar-free doesn't always mean healthier. Again, a lot of starchy foods like white rice uh, don't have a lot of nutritional value. Uh, white rice is uh, tasty, and uh, it, but it has a lot of carbohydrate. And look how much nutrition value you get for that. If you compare a cup of white rice to a cup of lentils, the lentils has four times the protein, um, much more iron. 
calcium, magnesium. So again, I was encouraging people to get a more beans and lentils for a good source of protein. So why do we worry about carbohydrate during pregnancy? Well, most of our time on this planet, uh, food scarcity has been more of an issue. So the placenta has evolved to put out hormones and even to put out a insulinase to break down mom's insulin more rapidly to push mom's blood sugar up in pregnancy so mom provides enough glucose for the developing baby. So interpreting this slide, that apple you eat at five weeks gestation, by the time you're 30 weeks pregnant, your body has to produce more than twice as much insulin to process the carbohydrate from that apple. So um, if your body isn't able to keep up with this tripling of insulin requirements, you'll develop gestational diabetes, and that can put your baby at risk. Some of us can't modify all our risks. I, I always joke with people, the best way to avoid diabetes is choose your parents wisely. You want to choose parents that don't have, have diabetes, because that's about half your risk right there. So inherent risks are family history, age. The age for risk of diabetes going up starts at age 25. Each pregnancy we have as women increases our risk of diabetes because of this stress on the pancreas. Um, ethnicity, and um, I had the pleasure of working with Lata Palanapian on uh, an interesting study, insulin resistance in Southeast Asian women, and now she's just pu published a study finding that 15% of Asian women develop gestational diabetes, with Vietnamese women having three times the risk of Japanese women. So um, Kaiser Northern California did a study as well that showed by a time an Asian woman is 38 years of age, one in four will get gestational diabetes, so even at normal body weight. So the risks are very high for certain ethnic groups. So this great study showed us that um, if you modify your lifestyle, you might be able to reduce the risk of gestational diabetes by 83% by not smoking, having a normal BMI, eating a healthy diet, and engaging in moderate uh, exercise 20 minutes a day. Uh, you notice I put uh, a BMI category less than 23 for Asian women. This is for the World Health Organization. And again, because in Asian populations, there's higher rates of diabetes at a lower body weight, the World Health Organization actually uh, recommends a lower um, BMI category for normal weight. So how well are we doing as US women in meeting these goals? Pretty good for smoking. Uh, about 80% of US women don't smoke. Only about 40% uh, of US women have a normal BMI. So again, I think you can mitigate that a little bit, a little exercise and reducing a little bit of weight. The third one is the one I think is the one we should really focus on. Less than 30% of American women of childbearing age are getting 20 minutes of exercise a day. So that's pretty easy for all of us. Start doing a little bit of walking every day. Uh, and then the other factor is to have a, a healthy diet. So in summary on carbohydrate, carbohydrate is necessary for your baby, but don't overdo it and don't do it all at once. You want to do small, frequent meals, combine your carbohydrate with some protein and fat, choose healthier carbohydrate foods like a piece of fruit, um, um, good vegetables, beans, and lentils. Um, eat whole fruit, don't do the fruit juice. Um, most, most of you wouldn't sit down and eat three oranges all at once, but you're getting the equivalent of about the sugar from about three oranges and a small glass of orange juice without any of that fiber. And again, three meals and two snacks a day are better than three big meals. So micronutrients in pregnancy, um, there's a huge increase in iron requirement during pregnancy. Your red blood cell uh, count uh, needs to go up to account for the expanded blood volume. A lot of this is in the second and third trimester. So a lot of women do become anemic during pregnancy and will re recommend an iron supplement for you. Your prenatal vitamin does have some iron in it, um, but it may not be enough in the second and third trimester, especially for you twin moms. Uh, you do have increased needs for protein, but some of these nutrients uh, are really, really critical. And as I mentioned before, folic acid is one of the most important ones early in pregnancy, even before you're expecting. So um, women at higher risk for vitamin mineral deficiency are vegans. Um, uh, you really need to get B12 from the diet uh, if you're following a vegan diet or take a supplement. Uh, vegans are also more likely to be iron and protein deficient multiple gestation pregnancies, and again, you need to be eating more often, teens if you start pregnancy, underweight, and also closely spaced pregnancies. Uh, women that have uh, get pregnant within a year of a prior pregnancy, your, your body's a little bit depleted, so you might want to have to take a little extra attention to making sure you're taking an extra supplement or, uh, or taking your supplement um, between pregnancies, and certain medical conditions that impact um, uh, could impact a pre healthy pregnancy or your ability to absorb nutrients. This is just some of the general um, micronutrient recommendations during pregnancy. 
One thing I will mention with twin moms as well is don't take two prenatal vitamins. Uh, too much of a good thing is not always good. We know that a lot of uh, nutrients share absorptive mechanisms. For example, zinc and iron share an absorptive mechanism. So taking too much iron, you could create a zinc deficiency. Taking too much zinc, you can create a copper deficiency. So you don't want to overdo one nutrient. Also, some vitamins are toxic in large amounts, and we'll talk a little bit about that when we get to talking about vitamin A. Pregnancy iron needs, um, you need about 15 milligrams per day extra iron for the expanded red blood cell mass, especially second and third trimester. You do absorb iron better from meat sources, but you can uh, increase the absorption of iron from your plant sources if you add a vitamin C source there. So make lentil soup and put some nice bell peppers in it for that extra vitamin C there. Um, your body does require more calcium during pregnancy, but the body's pretty smart about it. You actually absorb uh, calcium better from the gut during pregnancy. And don't worry that your baby won't get enough. We have a great reservoir for calcium as women. We will mobilize it from our bones to keep blood levels stable. So a lot of the calcium recommendation is to protect your bone health in the future. Um, so you do require a little extra calcium in pregnancy, and your prenatal vitamin won't, won't include the full amount you need because calcium is a big mineral, and if they put all the, the calcium in there along with everything else, it would be too big to swallow. So if you don't think you're getting enough calcium from the diet, you can always take a separate supplement. Folic acid um, is really important because they've discovered that folic acid can reduce the risk of neural tube defects such as spina bifida and possibly other defects such as cleft palate and even um, cardiovascular defects. So it's recommended that all women that could possibly become pregnant are taking a uh, prenatal or a multivitamin that provides at least 400 micrograms per day of folic acid. During pregnancy and lactation, we recommend a supplement with one milligram per day. And if a woman has previously given birth to a baby with a neural tube defect, then she should be on extra supplementation, uh, four milligrams per day. Um, folic acid is so important in the diet to prevent birth defects that the US started fortifying food and neural tube defect rate dropped 19% two years after the food supply started being fortified with uh, folic acid. There's a lot of uh, literature about some of these other antioxidant nutrients that have increased need during pregnancy. Pregnancy is a time of increased metabolism, oxidative stress. Um, in some countries, like in Japan, they, they add coenzyme Q, which is an antioxidant nutrient that works at the mitochondrial level. Um, lycopene, which is a nutrient we find in tomatoes, has uh, been shown to have some antioxidant effect. And, and um, some studies have pointed out that some of the, these uh, nutrients might play a role in preventing risk of things like uh, preeclampsia. But the data is not conclusive yet. Some studies show positive benefits, some studies don't. So there's not really enough data out there that I can make a specific recommendation about those. There can be a problem if you uh, double up on your multivitamin, for example, or your prenatal vitamin. Uh, vitamin A is teratogenic, so it can cause birth defects in large amounts. That's why it's no longer recommended. Back in the 20s and 30s, everybody said, eat liver. It's a great source of uh, vitamins and protein and iron when you're pregnant. But now we know the liver is where we clear a lot of toxins, and the liver also stores a lot of vitamin A. So eating liver, you can actually get toxic amounts of vitamin A. Um, it's recommended not to get more than 5,000 international units of uh, preformed vitamin A a day from your multivitamin or prenatal vitamin because you will get the rest from your food as well. Um, now, I, I made the differentiation there. Preformed vitamin A, you, get, you can also make vitamin A, active vitamin A, from carotenoid pigments, from carrots and things like that. And there's not, not a harm to eating too many carrots. Um, the only harmful uh, side effect that I know of if you get a lot of carotenoid pigments is it might turn your skin orange. I don't know if you remember, there was a case um, a while back in the UK of a, uh, a schoolboy who was drinking Sunny Delight, and he was drinking like two liters of Sunny Delight a day, and he turned orange. Um, and that's, this was because Sunny Delight is actually fortified with carotenoid pigments, and some tanning agencies that as well. So that was a funny story. Um, be careful what you do after you deliver your baby with all those iron tablets. They look like M&Ms. They're really cute, and they account for um, poisoning in children. So pediatric iron-related injuries uh, were about, on average about um, uh, 3,000 per year reported in the period 1986 to 1990. And most kids that um, were poisoned by iron supplements got them. They were left over from mom's prenatal or, or mom's um, iron supplements. Um, I think when we had babies born in our house, we bought just a toolbox and put a padlock on it, and that's where we stored most of our medications. But, you know, best laid plans. I think I only called poison control once when my kids were small, and I'd left a, um, a diaper rash cream on the floor, and one of my toddlers ate 
some of the tube and poison control said, oh, well, he might have a tummy ache and a little diarrhea, but that's it. So I was lucky. One call, the poison control was all. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about um, pregnant women that might have increased nutrition needs. Any vegetarians out there? Okay, great. So I see a couple of, I do see a lot of women that follow vegetarian diets. Um, and vegetarian diets can be very help, uh, healthful. Um, my daughter has gone vegetarian and vegan and ended up with a GI bleed in college. And I, I attribute this a little bit to the, the uh, semester of living on vegan baked goods, which they apparently had very good at her college and not a lot of um, other healthier foods. So um, a vegan diet can be healthy if you're choosing enough lentils, things like that. Vegans do need to have a source of B12 in their diet, either from fortified foods or from a supplement. Iron, so you can get a lot of iron from beans and lentils, greens. Um, a DHA source for, for a vegetarian diet might be a marine algae supplement or something like that. They do make one for kids even called, it's gummy fish. It sort of tastes like a cross between a Sour Patch Kids um, candy and uh, tuna fish, so not the most tasty thing. And I got those from my vegan daughter once, and she would not eat them. Um, adequate protein sources for vegetarian diets. Um, if you're including dairy products, really not much risk. You're going to get complete protein there. Things like Greek yogurt and uh, uh, dairy eggs and milk are great sources of um, uh, protein for uh, vegetarians that include eggs and dairy products. Uh, calcium can be another nutrient of concern. Uh, if you're not including dairy products, you can get calcium from uh, vegan sources, collard greens, almonds, broccoli, sesame seeds, and some soy products are very good. Um, there are some women that have increased uh, nutritional needs, uh, including women with the higher rates of obesity. We're seeing a lot of women now get pregnant post-gastric bypass. The recommendation is to delay pregnancy for 18 months after you've had a gastric bypass operation. They have seen a little bit increase in birth defects in women that get pregnant sooner than that. We've also seen some women get unexpectedly pregnant and do just fine. Again, closely spaced pregnancies, you can have some increased risk and other medical conditions. So we'll talk a little bit about twins and more. Um, magnified nutrient needs as well, accelerated depletion of maternal nutrients. So it's really, really important to just eat more frequently. I usually recommend if you're expecting twins or triplets to eat a bedtime snack and eat first thing when you wake up in the morning. And if you wake up at night and you're hungry, then go ahead and eat a little snack then. Steady supply, because you're going to find it hard to eat enough at one time. Uh, there's a lot of controversies about how much weight you should gain when you're expecting twins. So I put two slides in here. This is some recommendations by Barbara Luke. And she focused a lot on uh, just, again, one study that she did. And she looked at um, the importance of gaining weight up to 20 weeks. So this is kind of a busy slide. I apologize. But that first column there, she's, she's actually recommending um, a net weight gain. And I put that at the top. So for underweight women, she recommended a net weight gain of 50 to 62 pounds, but gained 25 to 35 pounds of it by 20 weeks. Uh, normal weight women, 40 to 54 pounds, gaining 20 to 30 pounds by 20 weeks. If you're overweight, gain 38 to 47 pounds at, um, net gain, and but 20 to 25 by 20 weeks. And finally, for obese women, to gain 15 to 20 pounds by 20 weeks and 29 to 38 pounds overall. And she gave some recommended rates of weight gain. Uh, Institute of Medicine in 2009, they didn't have any um, underweight recommendations, but their recommendation for twin pregnancies, again, was just a second and third trimester rate of 1.5 pounds per week if you are expecting twins and you start at a normal weight, 1 to 1.2 pounds per week if you are um, starting with an overweight BMI, or 1 pound uh, per week if you are starting at an obese BMI. So again, a lot of controversies exist about what the optimal weight gain is, and there's even less data on twin pregnancies uh, and triplet pregnancies. Increased nutrient requirements again, especially iron and calcium in uh, twin pregnancies as well. Um, and let's move on and talk a little bit about common discomforts of pregnancy, nausea, heartburn, and constipation. I, I teach a class similar to this to the medical residents, helping them prepare to be good caretakers for you pregnant ladies out there. And I tell them if your patient is not uh, pooping regularly, she is not a happy lady. It really doesn't feel good. So we talk a little bit about that. For those of you that aren't in medicine, it's nice to review a little bit of physiology here. On the left, you can see a, a woman's anatomy um, prior to pregnancy. And you can see her bladder isn't, doesn't have um, a baby's head sitting on it. Um, her intestines are not scrunched up. Her stomach has plenty of room there. And then you compare that to a woman who's near delivery. And uh, in, in addition to the urinary frequency, just from making more urine, because you're metabolizing, you're processing baby's bloodstream as well, baby's head is resting on mom's bladder. 
Um, I remember asking the doctor what this weird lump was that I felt up near, near my sternum, and they said, oh, that's just where your intestines get shoved up uh, at this point in pregnancy. So it's harder for food constants to empty during pregnancy. It's almost impossible not to get heartburn because literally your stomach is shoved up towards your throat and um, uh, things just don't move well during pregnancy. So you can be a little uncomfortable by the time you're in the third trimester. So again, eating smaller meals more often not only helps uh, nutrient supplies to baby, but it just may make you feel a little bit better. If you're having a lot of nausea and vomiting, sometimes eating your meals dry and then sipping the liquids between meals may help, just because just it's a little harder to bring dry food up than, than a lot of liquids. Um, try doing low odor foods. Um, I had a dad once uh, who was, when his poor pregnant wife, who was very nauseated, was first waking up in the morning, he was trying to feed her sardines because he thought fish was good for her, and she was quite upset because the smell was disturbing to her. So low odor foods may be more helpful earlier in pregnancy. Some women have reported salty foods, like pretzels uh, and chips help a little bit settle the stomach, or some crackers, um, and tart foods like some lemon might help. Some women find it helpful to just put some crackers at bedside and put a little something in your stomach before you get out of bed. Um, small frequent meals, again, can help with constipation and heartburn. If you're constipated, you really, really need to up your fluid intake. Um, sip it throughout the day. And a lot of us think if we're eating salads, we're getting a lot of fiber. Two cups of lettuce has two grams of fiber. It's not a lot. Um, you want to put a cup of black beans on your salad, you'll add another 15 grams of fiber. And you can do a very high fiber brand cereal like All Bran um, and get 10 grams fiber in one serving there. Um, very few Americans reach a, a, the target 28 grams at least a day of fiber. Most of us get 10, closer to 10 to 15 grams per day. Um, again, I hate to pick on rice a little bit, but a cup of white rice gives you less than a gram of fiber. If you replace that with beans or lentils, you can up the fiber to about 15 grams. And there's a lot of other good whole grains on the market now, too. Quinoa, farro, cracked wheat, lots of good grains. Uh, and again, this is a good list just of some fiber-rich foods there. Um, some of my favorite uh, fruits, raspberries are very high in fiber, 8 grams per cup. Uh, that's a lot more than you would get in a banana, um, beans and lentils, uh, and lots of uh, fruits and vegetables can definitely help. But talking about foods and fruits and vegetables, you need to be a little more careful about foodborne illness for pregnant women. Um, you want to wash hands more carefully. You want to cook animal products completely. No soft boiled eggs during pregnancy. No rare steaks. You want to wash all produce before you eat it. You want to avoid any unpasteurized dairy products, juices, or cheeses. Um, you don't want to eat liver. Uh, you also want to limit seafood. Um, seafood can contain mercury and also can contain uh, fertilizer runoff if you're eating freshwater fish where um, there's been a lot of PCBs in the water from fertilizer runoff. Um, food that touches the soil, so uh, recent listeria outbreaks have been from cantaloupe, strawberries, green onions. You want to be extra careful if you're eating produce that comes direct in contact with soil like carrots or potatoes, especially if you're going to eat it raw and not cook it. Cooking and, and heating will destroy the listeria, but um, a lot of pregnant women know to avoid changing the litter box, but um, I always say if you're touching soil or food that touches soil, all the animals in the neighborhood, the soil is the animal litter box uh, for your neighbor's cat. So you want to be really careful with produce that grows on the ground. If you're not going to peel it um, or cook it, be sure and wash it thoroughly. There was an outbreak of listeria from cantaloupe. Cantaloupe is, uh, you don't usually eat the peel, but the, the bumpy surface um, harbors the bacteria a little bit more. And if you don't wash the outside skin before you slice through it, you can actually transfer the bacteria from the outside to the inside. If you're going to cook it, you don't need to worry about it so much. Um, you also want to minimize exposure to pesticides. This is a slide I borrowed from the Environmental Working Group. And every year they come out with, uh, they study and, and put a list out of what the cleanest, least contaminated fruits and vegetables are. And um, they always put out their dirty dozen, which are um, the most highly contaminated uh, produce on the market. You can pick this up if you just Google the dirty dozen um, environmental working group. You, you can find that information online. So it might be worth your dollars if you, if you want to buy apples, for example, to spend the money for organic, whereas asparagus and avocados are really low contaminant level. You can go ahead and just buy the regular for those. Okay. Um, caffeine has been highly debated, and, and um, the consensus seems to be now the, a little bit of caffeine in pregnancy is fine, usually about 200 milligrams per day. 
Um, this is also good. We were talking earlier before I came in about the new USDA guidelines saying that coffee may be good for us in, in reducing risk of certain diseases. So I'm, I'm a big coffee fan, so I'm great to hear more research that we can have a little bit of coffee in our diet. But uh, that 200 milligrams per day for, for pregnancy, a 16-ounce Starbucks coffee is going to shoot you over that pretty rapidly. Um, I drink Pete's coffee, so I imagine that's even higher. So you want to be cautious not to overdo the coffee, but I know some of you are so conscientious, you know, you won't even eat one Hershey's Kiss. So uh, again, I put down there even a, a whole Hershey's special dark chocolate bar is only 31 milligrams caffeine. So you can fit, fit a little bit of caffeine in your diet during pregnancy. So if you're really craving that cup of tea or coffee. Sometimes a little bit of coffee in the morning may help get the bowels moving if you're suffering from a lot of constipation. So let's move on to the postpartum issues so I can leave some time for questions here. Uh, we want to talk a little bit about losing your pregnancy weight, healthy diet and lifestyle, and encouraging you to breastfeed. Hopefully you're planning on breastfeeding before you even become pregnant. Learn about breastfeeding when you're pregnant, and everybody should be encouraged to breastfeed. We're, we're very breastfeeding friendly here at, at uh, Stanford. One of our great nurses is sitting up front here, Deb Greenwood. If you're uh, afterwards, if you have any questions on breastfeeding, you can talk to Deb Greenwood. Susan Crow, one of our physicians, has been a big promoter in um, making us a very breastfeeding-friendly hospital. But I do want to talk about losing your pregnancy weight. It is tough to lose the pregnancy weight. I gained the 50 pounds they recommended for a twin pregnancy, and I'm a dietitian, and I, was, I didn't lose it for eight years, so it took me a long time. Um, to take that pregnancy weight off. Um, most women, um, if you check their weight a year after they've given birth, they're going to be heavier than they were. 44% of women who started pregnancy overweight were obese one year postpartum, and 30% of women that had a normal pre-pregnancy BMI were overweight or obese one year postpartum. Breastfeeding and exercise can reduce the risk that they retain this weight. Um, why do we care if you gain a little bit of weight between pregnancy? If you go up one BMI point between baby one and baby two, that second pregnancy you have a 30% increased risk of gestational diabetes. And that risk is increased even more if you go up a BMI category. So if you've gone from normal to an overweight BMI category, your risk is essentially doubled. So tips for losing weight afterwards. First of all, be a little easy on yourself. I, I, I encourage you to have realistic um, body image goals. And I think especially if you're going to be a parent to um, a girl, we really want to encourage our daughters to have realistic body images. Because I know um, I was discouraged. I think when I was pregnant, Demi Moore had that beautiful naked pregnant picture on the cover of a magazine. And I just thought, oh my god, that doesn't look anything like my naked body right now. <laughs> and, and it was kind of discouraging. And this is what most of us are exposed to all the time. The average fashion model is actually underweight with an unhealthy BMI of about 16. So this is the average fashion model or the average movie actress compared to the average American woman. So I think we would need to really encourage healthy body images in our media and what we represent. And also for, to be a little easy on ourselves that so we can't be expected to um, look so perfect. Little changes can add up. Um, I always think about that gentleman that was so dismayed when his doctor told him he had to lose 100 pounds that he did nothing. It, tiny changes can add a lot of pounds onto us. Two extra Oreos a day, if it's above your basic needs, can cause you to gain about 10 pounds in a year. But if you walk one extra mile a day, you can lose 10 pounds in a year, if all things being equal. Um, drinking water, if, if I could wave a magic wand and make one change in everybody's diets, I would eliminate sodas. Uh, regular soda is probably one of the most toxic things in our diet right now. I don't know who's responsible at, at Children's Hospital here, but if you notice, if you go in our cafeteria, you cannot buy a regular soda. And I applaud the physicians, I think the pediatricians group, that were so concerned about sodas in our kids' diet that removed soda from our cafeteria. Um, one 12 ounce soda a day could put 15 pounds a year on you and a recent study I read that showed just one 12 ounce soda a day can increase uh, diabetes risk by about 20 percent. This I stole a little bit from, uh, there's a whole, there's actually one diet book on the market that is uh, evidence based and it's called Volumetrics and it's written by Barbara Rolls who did research at Penn State. Most diet books are not science based at all. And she found that you can increase satiety and reduce people's caloric intake just by increasing intake of um, foods that have a high water content like broccoli. So I know I can sit down to a big plate of food. If, if I just tell somebody they have to cut down on their portions from two cups of pasta to dinner to one, they're going to feel deprived. But if you change that two cups of pasta to three cups of uh, pasta mixed with vegetables, you can really reduce the caloric mix but keep the volume up. So that's one strategy. 
And I want to encourage every woman here to breastfeed their baby. Um, there, are, I, there could be a whole class on breastfeeding. I just want to touch on some of the reduction in risk for your baby, reduction in ear infections, reduction in gastrointestinal infections, even a reduction in childhood leukemia, celiac disease, type 1 diabetes, asthma, food allergies, 72% re risk reduction of hospitalization in your baby's first year of life. And for you, you're going to have decreased risk of breast cancer, diabetes. Oxytocin produced when you breastfeed your baby is going to help your uterus return to normal size, and it's going to help you lose your weight after baby's born. Breastfeeding twins is really wonderful. The one caution I can tell you there is I got used to eating enormous amounts of food, and it was really hard when babies weaned uh, to uh, cut back down. I wanted to hire myself out as a wet nurse. I thought this would be a great breastfeeding plan. Uh, nutrition during lactation. Your fluid requirements, I harped on that a little bit earlier. You need about four liters of water a day to produce enough breast milk. I made it all the way through pregnancy without getting hemorrhoids. I got so constipated, I think dehydration, breastfeeding twins, that I ended up with hemorrhoids after babies were born. So be sure and keep your fluid intake up to help produce that breast milk. You do need extra calories for breastfeeding, but your um, body can um, supply some of that if you gain some extra weight during pregnancies. You can mobilize that as well. Um, if you are planning on breastfeeding, maybe just continue taking your prenatal vitamin. It'll help provide some of those nutrient needs as well. And we mentioned here almost four liters a day of water are needed to stay hydrated during breastfeeding. Again, you're making that breast milk from uh, nutrients in your bloodstream, so you might want to keep up the same type of eating style, eat frequently. When you sit down to breastfeed your baby, have your loving husband bring you a nice glass of water or something to drink. So that's one thing dads can do to help out. You do lose some bone mass when breastfeeding, but um, generally you recover that bone that you've lost within six months after you wean your baby. Um, Allergies, occasionally babies can develop an allergy to something mom's eating. It's pretty rare. Um, if you have mucus or blood speck stools in your, the, in your baby's diaper, maybe check out with your pediatrician. Foods that are more likely to cause an allergy are uh, eggs, dairy products, uh, soy and wheat products in mom's diet. So I'm doing pretty well on time here. I just want to wrap up. So preconception, pregnancy, and postpartum. We talked about weight all the way through. Preconception, you want to normalize weight or lose a few pounds if you're overweight. During pregnancy, you don't want to gain too much weight, but don't starve yourself. It's appropriate amount of weight gain for your BMI and your, uh, if you're expecting one baby, two, or three. After pregnancy, you might want to try and take all that weight off before you become pregnant again, or the risks of gestational diabetes, preeclampsia, and some other conditions can be greater in that second pregnancy. Stay active. We now know that for most women, Physical activity all during pregnancy is a good idea. Now, having said that, if you're not a runner, maybe it's not the time to try and for, train for a marathon when you're pregnant. I had a woman come in and ask me, can I do this mud run? Um, I'm pregnant, and I want to do this run. It involves jumping over hurdles, leaping under obstacles. Um, I said, I don't think that sounds like a good idea, but I'd be happy to run it by your doctor. And they laughed and said that she could do the run, but she could not do any of the obstacles, and she was not to try and win the race. She was supposed to hang to the back of the pack. So go for a walk 20 minutes a day. If you're already a runner, you can probably keep up with that, but now's not the time to try some really high intense activity. Avoid smoking, avoid alcohol. Avoid uh, food and environmental toxins. That's really important for pregnant women. Um, take a prenatal vitamin or a multivitamin that has folate in it. Um, and consider uh, taking a multivitamin for micronutrient insurance in the postpartum period if you're breastfeeding as well. And finally, plan on breastfeeding even before you plan your pregnancy. Prepare for breastfeeding while you're pregnant. And you're going to be exhausted and overwhelmed when you take that baby home. But breastfeed that baby. And if you're having trouble breastfeeding, call Deb up in clinic or make an appointment with Susan Crow or get some lactation support when you're still in the hospital. It's very, very challenging. It's new to you and your baby. Put that baby skin to skin, bare baby on your bare chest, and that will enhance your uh, success with breastfeeding. Um, so we talked about some common themes tonight. Um, I, again, I wish everybody could start at a healthy weight, but um, if you don't start at the healthiest weight, try not to gain too much weight during pregnancy and try and lose your baby weight after delivery. But be easy on yourself. Don't feel guilty if you're not starting out at a perfect weight. Healthy diet. And again, all of us should be eat, working a little bit healthier on our diet. That doesn't mean you can't have an ice cream bar. That doesn't mean you can't have a little bit of chocolate. Think about the, the sort of the 80% rule. 80% of your food choices should be really good, and you can splurge a little bit with that other 20%. Do something for exercise and breastfeed your baby. Remember, this is kind of what a healthy diet should look like for all of us. 
And some take home thoughts again. I don't want anybody to walk away tonight feeling guilty about um, the cheese it binge they had or um, the chocolate bars they've eaten or if they didn't start a, at the perfect weight. Most women are going to have a healthy baby, even if they didn't start out at a perfect weight and even if they don't have the healthiest diet. And I handed out this resource sheet here. It just gives you some um, links to some healthy uh, uh, tools for more information, including our own website. And I will finish that up with some questions. And I will tell you that these are my babies, the, the twins I showed in both spots there. So they are 23 years old right now and graduated college last year. So um, I'm happy to answer any questions, including on twin pregnancies, since I have some experience there. <laughs>